Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday q and I'm Eric Griffin, president of ITM Trading. And with me, I have Lynette Zhang, our chief market analyst. For those of you who don't know or are tuning in for the first time, we take your questions submitted to us at questions at itmtrading.com. That's an email address where you email them. And then I put them here on a one sheet. I ask them to her live. She's not seen any of these questions, so you get a real, true, organic response. And I eat organic, so it really is an organic response. There, there you go. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. She eats mostly everything off of her own farm. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. <clears throat> Jason S. asks, if and when U.S. rates go negative, mm -hmm. can you explain how those negative bond rates will translate into the rates impacting everyday retail banking products and instruments? Well, that's a really good question because it's something that they're experimenting with right now. We know we have the first negative rate mortgages over in Denmark, and that is to keep the really seriously overvalued real estate continuing to go up because then the Danes don't complain because they feel richer. Uh, but credit card rates are still highly positive, <coughs> you know, considering <coughs> that banks are, are in negative rates. I think the, and I could be wrong about this, but I think the average uh, interest rate on credit cards, even with rates in that range in, in the EU, is something like 17%. Don't hold me to that, but I, I think I read that uh, pretty recently. So on the banking product, what the banks are having to do is supplement the loss of the income between borrowing cheaper from depositors and then loaning them out that out or using it uh, to charging more fees. This is the big dilemma that they're also testing in Europe right now um, with a scandal that I, I just talked about recently. So it's a really good question, and I don't think anybody really knows what that answer is going to be yet because it's not like we have any level of historic precedence to determine where those fees right. and those costs are going to go. I was even going to ask you in relationship to the Denmark piece, right? You have the negative interest rates on the mortgages, but are they doing negative interest rates on people's checking accounts simultaneously? Uh, that is like <clears throat> the next big issue because so far they have not transmitted the negative rates to those other products. But, you know, Germany's up in arms. So a lot of, a lot of uh, country, northern countries are more up in arms because it looks like, yeah, it's going to be transmitted to the savers. Mm -hmm. You know, right. southern countries aren't so concerned about that, but it seems like the northern ones are. So, you know, we'll just have to stay tuned and see how they're, you know, where they go with that. And we'll talk about it once we see change in what they're already doing, just like we did with the mortgages. All right. So probably a good one to watch then if for answers to this, just as a as kind of a guideline would be would be Dan Denmark. Right? Absolutely. But like you said, you just don't know because every, every market will be different, I'm sure, right. as those things start to and, roll out. Right. And see, part of the problem is and um, that if they started to charge people to hold money in the bank while they still have, well, not every country has an easy availability to cash, but it really looks like they're focusing more now on a global basis uh, with the central banks really getting control, full control of the payment systems so that everything has to flow through their hands, which makes it easier for them to charge negative rates, withdraw taxes, et cetera, et cetera. That's actually what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. So you want to stay tuned for that one because uh, that's a much bigger piece. So I think that it is more likely that they're going to want to have that control in place before they really transmit the negative rates to the population. Because like in Japan, well, what they do, you know, safes were flying off the shelves because people are hoarding cash rather than dealing with the negative rates. And that's actually what they found in, in Europe and, and actually even here. More people are hoarding cash and taking out cash 
from the system, which is just the opposite of what they want. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is really fascinating um, just to just to be an oh, observer. Sure. Right. Wow. Well, especially because you love this stuff. Oh, my God. So uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure if you would know. Maybe you could answer this. So Scuba Duba okay. asks, I'm in the mutual fund industry. Okay. And almost every wholesaler mm -hmm. says that everything is fine. <laughs> Shocker. Which makes sense, right? They're trying <laughs> right. to sell their product. What is the number one thing I can put in front of them that they can't explain away? Well, crap, negative rates. I mean, can, can anybody really explain, even the central bankers, can anybody really explain why negative rates are good? I mean, just because we had the central and banker support. say that it's about a policy choice, it's not about a law of nature. I mean, that's just pure insanity. I'm sorry, you were saying? No, no, it, that's a good one. Anything else that you can think of that would, would kind of squash like an everything's fine comment? Well... Like an indicator that they could show. The, the, and also the globally inverted yield curves. That's a good one. The solution is not, well, let's push those middle rates back up. I mean, Japan tried yield curve control and it didn't work. Their yield curve still inverted because at the, at the end of the day, the markets are stronger than the central bank's power. So negative yield curves. Okay, explain that one to me and why this time, because we hear that a lot. Well, this is it's different this time. Okay, when you put the negative rates into a globally inverted yield curves and yield curves that are inverting in negative rates, how is that a positive? How is that likely to end? I mean, th those are those two are huge. I was thinking about some other questions that we had gotten that aren't that'll probably go on for next week. I thought I had one on here, but what you said there is super powerful. The markets are more powerful at than, the end of the day. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, than the central banks are right. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's that answers a lot of questions in and of itself that we get right. right? The, the markets will dictate what happens right when things get out of control. The central bankers can only dictate it as long as they have control over it. Exactly. Right? And when they don't anymore, the market forces will force things to happen that wouldn't be expected or could cause the col uh, collapse in exactly. certain areas, right? Right. Even if the plunge protection team is in there stopping things from buying, happening, buying the markets eventually up. will break their ability to, exactly. to, to do that. Well, look at what happened last night. And I don't know that you have a question on there or not. And because if they're a little bit older than what just happened with the repo rates, which we haven't really talked about. Oh, there we go. There is a question from it. Um, you know, what happened was liquidity went sucked out of the system. That's exactly what happened. You know, there, there were taxes that were due. There were bonds that needed to be rolled over and they needed dollars to do these transactions. And those dollars were simply not there. They were not available. No liquidity. So the central bankers went in and pumped $58 billion into the system to avert that. But here's the problem with that. Every time they do this kind of behavior, it has less and less, it works less and less. It has less and less impact. So what, Well, and the further and further that we get into debt, because ultimately that's where that comes from, right? Right. The further we get into debt, the more precarious the situation and the, the closer we are to something breaking and confidence being lost right All confidence being lost but a big chunk of that was on private corporations right so where we build out we uh, bailed out the banks and we're still bailing the banks out and especially now in the environment the low interest rate environment so they're trying to figure out how to keep the banks profitable right so this was a mini bailout and i've got to look into this a little bit more but um, you know, I think they've already started in this country with QE. Don't hold me to that. I got to look at it. But it came up in our meeting today when, you know, I mean, we are very collaborative here. So we meet every week and discuss what's going on. 
you know, and, and, and frequently that will lead me to do more research on it. Right. Well, because our team back, the, the team that is the front facing with our, our clients knows kind of the pulse of what's going on and what people are concerned about and what they're talking about. Right. So exactly. And, and, you know, we all pay attention, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, we get together and, and we collaborate. But, you know, it's very quiet. They don't want you to know that we're doing QE this time because that is an act of desperation. So it goes back to your first questions. Everybody's saying everything is fine. Right. Well, no. The behavior and what we're seeing in interest <clears throat> rates and especially with the repo rates, and I promise I will do something on that more specific. Just It just happened, so give me a second. But uh, that tells you just the opposite just the opposite. They scrambled to inject that capital into the system. They scrambled to do it. There's going to be some point where it really is not going to matter what they do. It's a con game. It's a confidence game. Right. And at some point, it's not going to matter what they do. Right. Once all confidence is lost, it's over. All right. So Chase A asks, <clears throat> when buying physical gold for a precious metals IRA, do you see this as the same as holding a physical asset as if it were in my possession? No, because it's not in your possession. Right. I mean, that that's a simple... Well, certainly thing. if there was I mean, something like an EMP attack, right? Let's say that just worst case scenario, EMP attack, and you know most of the IRA depositories are in Delaware, and you live in California, and there's an EMP attack, you're certainly not going to be able to get to your precious metals. And certainly I would think that the people who... Just thinking about human nature, the people who have access to those metals under a complete systemic collapse are certainly going to take them for themselves. I would just guess. Well, either that or if the government demands them, they're, they're not going to protect your interest over the government's. But even if they were to do something like um, the self-directed IRA uh, LLC, mm -hmm. right? So people feel safer with that because it is closer to them, mm -hmm. what do you think is going to happen during a major collapse or you, you think the banks are going to go, okay, here, you have full access to everything. We're not really sure what's in there, although they do have to know that the metals are in there because it has to be an approved depository, right? No. If it's a self-directed IRA LLC, that is, um, you can actually, they still have to be IRA approved metals. So they still have to be the bullion type metals. Yes. Right? But you can hold them in your own, even in your own safe at home. Really? Yeah. You, you change that? Yeah, you can have them in your own safe at home. Now, if you were going to do that, I've, I've talked about this guy before, but I would call Alan Small at AccuPlan because they specialize in setting it up in a way because it's very, you have to be, you have to follow the law perfectly. Otherwise, you can totally ruin the uh your ira and the irs will come in and and you know it, it, it's a it's a it can be a bad thing if you don't set it up the right way it's super important to do that super important to do mm -hmm. that we know of stories where people didn't and they they've gotten in big trouble um but yeah you can hold the the bullion metals in your own safe at home through an ira through the uh, self-directed ira llc okay so if you're talking about mm -hmm. doing an ira Although that is not my personal preference and not the choice that I have made, but if you are, that's probably going to be. As far well, as I the don't know. as far as I an mean, IRA is concerned with precious metals, it's definitely better to answer your question. It's better to have an IRA LLC and you set it up correctly. It costs you about two grand to set it up correctly and have the attorneys do it all. Once it's set up, then you can actually hold the metals in your safe at home. Any dealings though have to still go through the custodian as an approved custodian of the IRA, but it's definitely better than having it in a safe deposit box in, in Delaware. In Delaware, or... right. I mean, because honestly, <clears throat> if you don't hold it, you don't own it. It really, it really is that simple, even if they say that it's the physical and even if it's segregated in your name. Um, yeah, there's just more risk. Yeah, more there's risk more there. risk. Okay, Michael B., more risk than actually having it in your physical possession. Right. Michael B., why does increasing the money supply, printing more money, mm -hmm. cause inflation? I figure we throw in some simpler questions. For oh, this okay. Time. 
Uh, well, simply we get a lot because... of newer video people to the channel, and that's so good. sometimes that's I like good. to throw in a simple one, even though I know you've probably explained that a billion times. Well, that's okay. That's actually not a super simple question. For you, it is. Well, it's you know, like anything else, the more of something that is available, the less value that it has. I mean, it really is that simple. So the more money they create the less value, purchasing power value, that, and that's by design, that that currency has. And you're chasing the same amount when you're looking at physical anyway. You're chasing the same amount of goods and services, but there's a whole lot more dollars chasing them. And that's what creates the inflation. Right, and in hyperinflation, everybody knows that the value of their dollar is going down the very next day. So or, or everybody is or rushing out to minute. spend all of the money they have. They're right. spending everything. Nobody's saving anything. They're spending everything. More and more money's being created. More and more money's being spent. And so it's chasing fewer and fewer goods that causes the prices to rise. Okay, Mark T. During just, uh, Let me just add one more thing sure. to that. That's where all of the QE, or most, not all of it, because certainly if you think back to what your cost of living was in 2008 and what it is today, it's a lot more expensive. But all of that QE money that they've been printing has gone into reflating the stock market, the bond market, the real estate markets, and therefore keeping the derivative markets up. So that's where when they lament the fact that they need more inflation, well, okay. You know, we, we've got plenty of inflation. Now, whether or not it has trickled through the general economy yet, it... Well, you said before it's like mostly been asset inflation so exactly. far. Exactly. I was, uh, exactly. a friend of mine was telling me that he read an article this last weekend about, I don't, forgive me, I don't know where, remember where he said he read it, but he said the number one most vulnerable market in the United States is Riverside, California. Number two, Phoenix, Arizona. That's where we live. And they estimated that during the next real estate downturn that we that Phoenix will take a 35% correction. I bet you it's more than that. Because that, I can tell you... That's just a normal you, correction, though. That's uh, not that's accounting for, right. like, a reset or a hyperinflationary environment or anything. Just a normal real estate market correction. 35% in Phoenix. Yeah. I bet it's more than that, though. Because when, when that happened back in 2008 and 2009, um, I paid of what the, because I bought a, a um, foreclosed, well, yeah, it's historic, and that helps me with taxes, but it was a foreclosure, and I paid about half of what that mortgage was. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. At that time, so yeah, that, it was, that more, was seriously it was like, like 50, 50. Yeah, you were in that yeah. market. So yeah, it you, was like a, so, there was like a 50%. A lot of places had 50%. Yeah, correct. so I, I'm thinking it's going to be way more than 35%. Because my sister's home, I think, went from like two fifty to eighty thousand. So I mean, that's more than fifty percent. Right. Right. So uh, Mark T <clears throat> asks: During a reset, wouldn't that lead to so much social unrest that the market system as we know it would collapse? In which case, does it matter if you have gold or silver or not? There are bigger things to worry about at that point. Well, actually, I think you should be worrying about those things at this point, like food, water, energy security, community, shelter, and then you've got the gold and the silver for barterability so that you can survive through that. And, and hold your wealth through it. Hold your wealth through it and take advantage of those opportunities that always present because so much wealth has been purchased on debt mm -hmm. that it's coming back on the market. So 35% chump change won't even, you know, what happened in 2008? They did not allow those markets to fully express and go to an undervaluation level because there was too much riding on it. I don't, they, but they used up those tools so they're, they're not gonna be able to do it. And would you read the first part of that question again? Because there were some things in there that I definitely want to address. So he said, during a reset, wouldn't that lead to social unrest, such yes. social unrest that the market system as we know it would collapse? Okay, so let's let's <clears> stop <throat> there for a minute. Because you can, and it depends on which market system you're talking about. 
But if we're going local for a minute, then yeah, during that um, social unrest, you're going to see the most likely outcome is that you're going to see people bartering because wow, we get if our if you can't have access to the your money in the bank, well, it's not really your money. But if you can't have access, Reg D to, says it's not exactly that you can't have access to that, then you're going to have to come up with something else. And you guys see me wear jewelry all the time. And a big part of that is because this too is barterable. Even if it's costume, it's still physical, it's still real, and it's still in my possession. So if somebody likes this pin rather than a pint of strawberries, I get the strawberries, right? Now, when you're talking about the stock market, well, I have to do a piece on that. I know I did, it was a while ago. But yes, as the currency implodes and hyperinflation takes over, they can't even value the fiat markets because what are those markets valued in? They're, they're created from dollars. If they happen to pay you out, they pay you out in dollars and you can only convert them. In other words, when you sell them, you can always only sell them and receive dollars. So if the dollar, yeah, it does. It completely screws up the market, the fiat markets that they've put in place too. So it depends on which market you're talking about, but on so many levels, and guess what? That's already happened. Look at what's happening in the banking, uh, the banking sector right now is the transition, the FinTech and the, it, it's so fascinating. And even looking at the normal IPO market versus a direct listing market and the role of banks in the economy and the flow of funds through the economy has been morphing. This is not something we're looking at in the future. It's something that is already underway and it's really, really interesting. So I'm gonna, again, talk about the payment system uh, tomorrow, but we've gotta take a look at the fact that we do not live in Kansas anymore. We are not in Kansas. Denise, Six foot says, asks, <clears throat> who pushes the button on our reset? Who says go? Not me. <laughs> uh, somebody up very high up the food chain would be that. You know, it would be the government, but maybe even higher than that. And the only reason why you hear it and, and see any hesitancy is because I'm data gal. So if I can't prove it, I don't like to say it even if I have an opinion on it, but it would be at the highest level. AG 47 Liberty said, asks, how can the Fed buy debt if all they issue is debt? <laughs> Isn't that a great question? They issue the debt and then use it to buy up. It's just a different kind of asset. So when they issue debt, it's a different asset on their balance sheet versus yeah, they, just, they go and they just with... buy, they produce the debt to buy the other debt. But you know, that wouldn't be so bad. What's really bad is when they create money from debt and then buy up hard assets like all the gold at the same time that they manipulate those prices down. Thank you, JP Morgan and Citi and UBS and HSBC and all those guys will be talking about that too. Uh, scroll down, Meg, so is there more beneath that? No, it's fine. Uh, let's see. Albert S. asks, why are rising repo rates bad? <clears throat> well, because if you've got a reset debt and you have to pay a higher rate, that's bad, right? And that's the problem. All of this debt that's been accumulated on consistently, I mean, it's been a 30-year uh, decline in interest rates from somewhere north of 20% Fed funds rate in 81 or 82 or 83, something like that, when they were kicking this whole thing off to now we're going into negative rates. So, you know, all of that debt, it's been required that the interest rates go down so that they could just grow more and have the same payment. All right. Well, that's it for today for questions. Okie dokie. Um, I had an interview 
with Sean at SGT this morning and we had some very interesting topics. Um, one of them was on what just happened with the uh, RICO and JP Morgan Chase traders admitting for many years oh, to yeah. manipulating. And we said We've a little bit a lot about of questions it, but on there's that, so been, that's cool. You guys right, talked about it. We definitely talked about it. Um, we're going to talk about it some more m moving forward because there's been some, I've talked about it before, but there's been some additional um, shifts in there. And then, uh, t is it tomorrow? <laughs> that I have X22. So Dave is awesome. You have awesome. that tomorrow? I yeah. do have oh that gosh. tomorrow. And we have our interview with Ron Paul. You get a big day tomorrow. Exactly. <clears throat> I am going to be, <clears throat> yes. It's live. good. End up going and live. And you're going live. You get a big, big, big day tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I'll be pooped. Huge. But <laughs> huge. It's going to be huge. It's a good thing I eat organic. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that energy. It's a good thing. I'm just like a little energizer bunny. I just keep going. Uh, but it, tomorrow is going to be a really fun day. So I'm really, really looking forward to it. Yeah, so look for the coffee with Lynette with Ron Paul probably by the end of the week once yeah. our team gets it all edited and everything. Yep, I'm thinking, you know, by the end of the week. And then next week I have, oh, and I love him Absolutely so much. Absolutely not. Gerald's, no, that's not true. I have Gerald Salente. Oh, wow. Well, it's been like a year since we've talked to him. That'll be cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. has it been? May. Yeah. May, so not, not a year. Oh, maybe. That. Oh, yeah, yeah it's a been year way, way, like way too months. long. That's right. And he's from Kingston, which is my hometown, and I just love him. So that's uh, that's next week, and that's exciting. So if you have any <clears> questions <throat> about this or anything else, just send them to questions at itmtrading.com. If you like this, give us a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe and hit that little bell so that you get notified. And do not forget to visit our blog where, well, we don't have any images on there today, but that's where we put all of our images and links and everything like that. And some of the slides that I use, let's face it, they're a little complicated. So, you know, I encourage you not just to follow the links, but also to take a good look at those slides. Well, I always encourage people to pull, pull up, hit the link, right? Most of the time it's there before we start. Sometimes it's not because you go on before we can get it up there. But a lot of times it'll be there. You can click on the link and see all of the the um, slides, slides and everything while she's talking. So if you need to zoom in on a slide, you can see it while right while she's delivering the talk, yep. which just kind of makes it a little bit easier. Yeah, that, Plus that's she writes, a good point. Which is kind of a cool thing. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but she writes a little synopsis. So if you can't get to the video or you don't have enough time, you can always read the synopsis, which will take you like three or to five minutes to read and kind of get a gist of it. And that's always on our blog as well. Yep. But uh, tomorrow, Dr. Ron Paul, I'm so excited. Did you put on the, yeah, there always is a link to the blog, but it's itmtrading.com forward slash blog. Perfect. <clears throat> the link is in the description. Yeah. Make sure that you definitely go and see that one. We're we're gonna be talking about a lot of stuff. I'm he's one of my heroes, actually. He is. I, I Yeah, have, he's awesome. Yeah, I'm he's, excited for he's it. He's amazing. So we'll talk to you soon. We'll see you soon. And we'll see you tomorrow, actually. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>